Today, my guest is Rebecca Hardcastle Wright. Rebecca is a leading expert in exoconsciousness. Now, she's going to define exoconsciousness, but you can look at it as sort of the opposite of transhumanism. It states that humans have innate advanced abilities most of us have not tapped into. In her book, Exoconscious Humans, Will Free Will Survive in an Increasingly Non-Human World? She explores two very different futures for humanity. One where we choose transhumanism and another where we choose to unlock our true potential as humans. The choice is, of course, ours, and I hope you enjoy this interview. Well, Rebecca, thanks so much for uh, joining me here on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks so Alrighty. much. Yeah. Hello to all your audience and participants. Mm-hmm. It's it, nice you to know, meet this you. is going to be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is going to be an interesting discussion because, you know, this obviously we're going to kind of move into between this topic of, of AI and transhumanism and all the way over to consciousness and our ability to, you know, access innate abilities and why that question is so important right now. And I think there might even be some challenging moments uh, for listeners who may or may not um, even be open to certain possibilities that we have as humans, but you have the expertise to speak to these things very deeply. So it should be exciting. Um, I want to start things off just so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, how would you define this subject or the definition of transhumanism? Transhumanism is the uh, theory that natural biological humans uh, will not be able to advance or um, cope with, in simpler language, um, the future and that we will need to be extended by technological means. And that could be genetically, it could be robotically, it could be an arm, it could be an implant, um, just all the way across the board. Anything that you can think of to extend humans, um, human ability, human thought, human biology, all of that would be transhumanism. It's an extension of natural biological humans. Yeah. So when you say like coping with the future... Right, humans won't be able to cope with the future and where it's headed unless they extend themselves with technology. What do you What do you mean by that? Because in the mind of a transhuman, um, reality will be artificial. So um, humans, as um, what I call natural conscious humans, would not be able to fully be engaged in an artificial consciousness, in an artificial reality. Right. And that may so, be true. That, that yeah. may be true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it seems like our world right now is increasingly, I mean, the topic of AI has become, you know, discussed at length. Um, and it seems like in general, humans are being faced with this question of, and I see this coming up all the time, you know, this the stuff that AI is creating, whether it's writing, whether it's art, you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, can we sense and feel that it's not of a human, right? That it's not coming of a human, it's coming out of an AI. And I'd love to kind of get your, your take on that as we get into this discussion of what I'd love for you to define too, which is what an exoconscious human is. So an exoconscious human is, um, it, it refers to the innate, innate human ability. So something that all humans have. So their in, innate human ability to connect, communicate, and co-create multidimensionally with extraterrestrials, with spiritual beings, with this whole plethora of, of a psychic consciousness. Um, in terms of discerning transhumanism, in terms of discerning artificial, well, you know, I live in Arizona, so <laughs> we have a lot of artificial grass. I mean, nobody's <laughs> fooled, that's not real grass. <laughs> Right. It may look like grass and, you know, it may be, you know, save the planet type thing, but, um, or don't want to use a lot of water, but it's still artificial. And mm -hmm. I think once you, that's, t to me, that was the real danger of transhumanism was that it was such an all encompassing, um, I don't want to call it a threat, but it's an all encompassing program series of interconnected interlocked programs and we can talk about that 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 eventually what concerned me was that humans would then begin to lose this psychic ability so included right. in the psychic ability would be their connection to plants animals nature the cosmos that this 
all-encompassing multidimensional ability, the earth, the ground, under the ground, that we have in terms of a, a, a sixth sense, seventh sense, eighth sense, that that would tend to be minimized so that then we wouldn't recognize the artificial. Mm. Mm -hmm. So once you go down that path, then um, it's a home run for the transhumans. Right. So I, I kind of interpret that as what you're saying is if, if we if, if they're increasingly creating um, technologies that are pulling away, pulling our attentions away from from ourselves, our bodies, nature and into technology and into this focus on um, something that is is really outside of ourselves and, and is, let's say, lacks a, a sense of soul or spirit in many ways. Um, the more focus on that, the more we kind of just forget what it means to connect to those other things. And. I think the this kind of ever growing AI, you know, technological state that we're seeing is is kind of pushing that forward. So, would you suggest that? I guess like it's it's hard to discern, right? We have advancement of technology, which is can be helpful, right? In some ways, we can see that we can use these tools to integrate and create, uh, you know, a, a better situation for humans moving forward. But we have to be careful to not get too wrapped up in it and lose sight and lose sense of who we are. How, how would you speak to that in our in our culture right now? Well, one of the reasons that I, I wrote my book, Exoconscious Humans Will Free Will Survive in an Increasingly Non-Human World, was that I did see the possibility that free will would not survive. Mm -hmm. And what I became very concerned, and this was way back I lived in Washington, D.C. when I started my research back in 2016, 2015. And, um, and I began to see that it just wasn't about social engineering. Of we're going to divert your attention on the games and, and streaming television and whatever. But it was an actual genetic um, change in our, our brain and mm -hmm. the energy centers in our body, that genetically those would be changed so we wouldn't even have that capacity. And as a mom right. and as a grandmother, I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I, I, and it's a very, um, it, it just goes way beyond I play video games or, you know, I'm on TikTok all day. It's, it's way beyond that mm -hmm. right now. It's way beyond yeah. that. Right. So, the, so that kind of stuff is a precursor, right? It gets us focused, gets us interested. And then, you know, when you say it's beyond that, how would you, how would you define, like, are you saying that there's existing um, technology already that's well, well, well beyond these ideas? Or are you saying that there is something going on in humans already that is well beyond that? Like, how would you expand on that idea? Yes, I think that there is genetic engineering well beyond that. Yeah. So yes, that is that is that is part of the reconstruction of our DNA. That's part of um, CRISPR technologies. Mm -hmm. That's part of implant technologies. But most importantly, it's part of brain to computer interface technologies. Right. Yeah. Like like Musk's Neuralink and stuff like that. Must neural link, um, yeah, but it's 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 very so. So let's go back. I think how old all of this is because it's old. Mm -hmm. it, we we all. I mean, um, we we like to think, oh, you know, Open AI, you know, Chat GPT just came. Well, no, that's like mm -hmm. ten or fifteen years old, mm -hmm. and yet the history of it was denied us. And I write about it in my book what the history of Chat GPT is. It's the, the major news services and the and like uh, the, the Reuters and the, and the press that were writing, you know, sending all of this data into the news so that they could, quote, write their news copy about it. Well, they weren't writing yeah. news copy. They were copying. That's just old stuff. They've they've refined that technology. And and um, and it's the same thing with this genetic. I, so just to tell a quick story and. Um, in 1985, 86, I, I worked at a university in Dayton, Ohio called Wright State University. It was a relatively new university built, built from the ground up to be handicap accessible. Mm -hmm. So we had people going to class in hospital beds. 
Hmm. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. They lived in dorms. They had an aid. They get on the, the elevators. They could access every square inch of that campus that I knew of. Yeah. So a professor comes there to work, Gerald Petrosky, and he starts implanting sensors, outward sensors, on students and getting them up off their wheelchairs and walking hmm. in 1986. Yeah. One woman walked down the aisle to get married. Another person walked the graduation. There was all kinds of, oh, this really didn't happen. Regardless of those questions, that was occurring on that campus in 1986, mm -hmm. and he lost his job. Mm. And all of a sudden, the whole topic went underground and quiet. Yeah. And now we see today, when I lived in D.C., there was a lot of you know soldiers from the Middle East and... You know, I started to see, wow, 1986, 2015, here we are. It's all coming to fruition. Um, you know, DARPA's um, in three programs. I think they're in the second phase of it. They have ro human robotic so soldiers, human robotic troops yeah. now. Yeah. The old super soldiers, as they say. Right. And so when you... You know, you may say, oh, you know, that's a really extreme example. You don't know what you're talking about. If I hear that one more time, you don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. That's extreme. Yeah, it is extreme. But the extreme edges is where it starts and infiltrates down mm -hmm. into normal human life. And we have to realize that this is the MO of transhumanism. And yeah. that our, our, what we call in our exoconscious community, our natural human consciousness is not only a very delicate, finely tuned capability within our body that includes our brain. Certainly as a therapist, I see it includes our nervous system. These different chakras and energy systems, our, 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 our uh, etheric body, our astral body. Biologists don't even have a clue about how any of this works all together as a system. And yet mm -hmm. they want to run in and hack it. Yeah. Because they know it's a system and they know they can hack it. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is like, you know, we talk about the super soldiers, right, who are being enhanced by, you know, uh, this sort of transhumanist uh, technology and, and implants and so on and so forth. But you have that same military at the same time doing what I think is closer to what you're talking about with exoconscious humans, which is they're training the the remote viewing ability. They're training the intuitive abilities of, of these people. And, um, you know, after reading your book and going through it all, I mean, I think correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what you would love to see, right? Is, is humans work more on that ability, that innate ability, as opposed to the, you know, the artificial sense of it. I, I feel like transhumanism for those who cho choose to go down that path, Joe, that those humans will gain certain abilities and they may gain not intellect, but they may gain through sensors data. They'll, they'll become data collectors and whatever patterning happens off that data, that's then given to them also. So will they appear as more intelligent? Yeah, to an extent. Once again, how you define intelligence, it comes down to. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the same thing, I think, you know, we're just now on the cusp of, of, um, of moving into ment mental health genetics is just huge. It's going to be the next frontier. Yeah. And you're really talking directly at that point. And a lot of money is going to be made with that, with genetic mm -hmm. intelligence, so with changing genetic intelligence. I mean, Dean Radin is already taking his work that he did at the IONS Institute, all of that huge data bank of consciousness, people meditating, spirituality, and he's gone in this co cognogenesis. He wants to go in through the back of the neck and do uh, CRISPR DNA changes. Mm. 
because so he feels so like that's gonna that's gonna cure mental illness. Right. Right. So he's so his his technology. Let's break this down a bit. So, I mean, I know Dean as like a you know his research would at least to me up until hearing this would have been focused on, you know, humans have this capability. Um, are you saying that he's seeing this more of now we can kind of go into the back of the neck, use CRISPR. Now, how would this gene editing, um, it's not, I don't fully understand it, but is it, is it, is it like a technology? It's not necessarily a technological implant as much as it's a, it's a slicing. It's a slicing. So it's not implanting, it's altering. Right. And, and at that point, it's altering of like, DNA, that's, well, that's, that's the surface information that I have. Now it right. may also go a lot deeper than that. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's an inter That's an interesting one because I, I can't see Dean going down that road. I couldn't but I mean, either. And know, when right? I, I just stumbled on it one day and I'm like, yeah. no, this isn't, but no, if you go to Cognigenesis website, He's right there talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is interesting because it's like, it almost feels at times. And I think about this, it's like that you can push back and you can push back and you can push back on, on the direction that these things are going. But at some point, you know, for some people's careers, they go, well, I can't beat it. So I might as well join it. And, and I mean, if that's, if that's the, what he's thinking, I, I mean, it's still, I'd be surprised, but you know, I'm like, gosh, is it really that powerful? You know, this, this pull into, to this future. Oh, it's, it's, it's amazingly powerful. I, I, I think living in the scientific world is like living like Dean does. It's living in another reality and all mm. kinds of promises are made and profits are promised and, and, and new frontiers are promised. And it's, it, it's never, it's, it's just a different, they, they've wired themselves very differently to approach this. And, yeah. and I'm certainly not in favor of like, let, let's just shut it all down. No, <laughs> what, what, what I'm in favor of, cause this isn't going to go away. I mean, if anything, yeah. it's just going to get deeper and broader and ever more invasive in humans. All the, mm -hmm. all this, much of the scientific literature is coming to be, it's coming to fruition. Now, we can fight it. Now, that's not going to work. But what does work is just simply saying, no, thank you. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think when you say, no, thank you, then what you do is you open that door. You could save it on a quantum level, which, of course, Dean talks about all the time open that door on a quantum level and say, I'm ready to receive information. I'm ready to receive opportunities and work with communities that are going to bring even more healthy, sane technologies and ways of being human into life. I, I was just going to say, I, having worked with Edgar Mitchell for, for six years in Washington, D.C., you know, I know how I know, and you know how he felt about ions, about Institute for Noetic Sciences, about the ins and outs that had gone through there. And you know, I often just think about G. Edgar, you know, who's passed away. G. Edgar, you know, <laughs> what do you think about all this? And and just uh, I, I would just, because for them, it's what you were really talking about. It's all of it's. it's it, for Edgar, it was about enhancing all of these natural abilities. I mean, Edgar was healed yeah. of cancer with mm -hmm. consciousness. Yeah. And he was he was deep, deep into all of these, you know, cutting edge frontier communities. Yeah. And it's just as though, you know, now it's like you can kind of say, well, CRISPR is just going to come in there and sort of edit that. <laughs> We're just going to clip it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, could they, do you think they would make the argument after all these years that they might look at it and say, well, you know what, it, it, it's hard to get folks to be in a position where they can really have their consciousness, be, you know, because of the dedication and commitment, it sort of takes at times to have their consciousness, you know, heal something like cancer. 
um, versus, you know, how could we make this accessible to the average folk uh, that, that has to work, you know, and, and do their thing, and maybe they don't have the dedication. I mean, I'm just trying to come up with a devil's advocate oh, I, argument I think, here. But. Yeah, that's point well taken. And I think that part of this also is that we're in in these um, not early phases of technology because, you know, a lot of this has been around. I mean, Hitler had second-generation computers, for goodness sake. So it's yeah. been around a long time. But what what scientists are aware is that it moves really fast, mm -hmm. especially now. They have the ability to really pick up the pick up the pace, move it quickly, and and there's less patience for organic yeah. growth and advancement. And I I completely understand that. It's like you know well. I have a bunch of kids, so it's kind of like, you know, here you have a baby and that baby slows you down. Yeah. You can't even say how that baby slows you down. Yeah. And I'm sure a scientist would look at that and would be like, you know, whatever that kid needs, we're speeding it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. put a screen in front of it. And yeah, yeah. that isn't how humans are engineered. And instead of spending time thinking about geo, genetic, social engineering, I'm much more interested in finding out about how we're engineered on a multidimensional level because we don't yeah. know. We have hints of that, but there's a lot of empty spaces in there. Yeah, 100%. I um, Just sort of thinking about the idea of you were talking about like speeding things up or what, what can be shortcuts or hacks, you know, these sorts of things. And one of the things in the, uh, in sort of the consciousness and personal development space that I've heard so many times over the last 15 years that I, I think now people are starting to grasp onto a little bit more is um, people would always say, well, you know, doing mushrooms or doing ayahuasca, doing a psychedelic, for example, is like a shortcut to, to awakening. You just, you're immediately awakened. And I would say, you know, sort of, but not really. It's like there's, and it's something that it's like, yes, might you see something that opens you up to a reality beyond ours for sure. But then how do you integrate that? What do you do with that, that experience? And how does that become part of your everyday life? And, and how do you develop the skills of, of peering into those worlds if need be, but of, of making meaning and making purpose out of out of what can be seen through that, right? And and um, I, I wonder what your take is on on this idea of utilizing, um, what, let's say, spiritual shortcuts versus developing the innate skills our, ourselves. I I do um, on I, I run online coaching groups for people that identify as exoconscious, so they could be psychic experiencers, ET angels, spiritual beings, just a plethora of these abilities. And and I, I do have people on, in my groups that have tried the shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And they end up in the group. <laughs> because <laughs> they they need to integrate. That, that yeah. shortcut was great. It opened the door and it wasn't the answer. Right. It's almost like... <laughs> So it's almost like you think like somebody goes and has plastic surgery and they're like, wow, you know, I'm going to look amazing until like they're like they're 70 years old and then everything like slumps. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. there's just certain processes organically in humans that sure, you can take the shortcut and you're still going to have to face within your, I would say soul, your soul mm -hmm. still going to want to move you into those integrative experiences as you, as you as you so well put it there's not going to be your 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 soul is not going to say okay done with that yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> pull that off you, no it doesn't work like that yeah and you know it's that's interesting because it, it, it's almost like I, I, again, speaking with a lot of friends who've kind of been through this journey and, and who, you know, are on their 15th, 16th, 17th sort of ayahuasca journey, if you will. And that's not to, to put it down as much as to say there's a curiosity there, right? Like they're really searching for something um, when they're, they're taking that journey, but maybe not entirely grasping 
something that I think is so important is like, isn't, you know, sort of the point of being here on the planet to, to do the work and to, you know, to, to, to pull it up and, and say, hey, you know what, like we're supposed to be integrated and in making the most of this human experience and not just necessarily um, maybe trying to escape it to, to an extent. What's, what do you feel on that? Um, I think a lot of the shortcuts are actually um, not just a shortcut, but from as a therapist, I would say they're also um, filled with avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, not wanting to really do the work, uh, not really wanting to make the commitment, um, hoping yeah. that the shortcut's going to work, avoiding, you know, checking out and avoiding, hoping that that's going to... Avoidance just... I mean, it's something that humans do. It's something that I do, but on the long run, it it just doesn't work. And and um, I would say in my therapy practice, I also see the other side of people who have overdone it on these shortcuts and have fallen mm -hmm. into very very deep uh, depressions, as mm -hmm. well as. Um, on the extreme, also people that have fallen into schizophrenia, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that is that's that's almost like that should be written on, like you know, on the drugs where they say the side effects. Yes, yeah. this, this is definitely. A, I mean, you know, I've had twenty-year-olds in my in my therapy room sitting there crying, saying, you know, I've ruined my life. I'm, I'm a schizophrenic now. I, I don't know what to do with this. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to live now. Yeah. And it was just yeah, it's, overdoing it's, it. It, it. Our, our, our yeah. nervous and brains, our nervous system and our brain just can't, we don't have respect, but you know, there's another funny topic in here, Joe, and that's the plant world. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we don't talk about very much is how the plant world and the animal world is being artificially um, enhanced. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. happening very rapidly. As, a, as a, um, the, the old biological classifications that we learned in, in school are no longer applicable. In the 1970s, a group of biologists met in this really beautiful um, setting in Northern California and decided at that time that they would um, begin to um, alter and reclassify everything in nature. Hmm. And that, wow. that is, that is well underway. So uh, when you say alter and reclassify, um, are we talking about sort of like how cannabis, for example, is being, uh, engineered in ways hybridized. Or, or hybridized in ways to produce greater THC and that's the plant one, profile is not quite that's the same. That's one example. HM, uh, you know, GMO, yeah. GMO um, foods ex uh, certainly, but I mean, that goes back to, you know, World War II, World War I. Yeah. Certainly that, but also there's a, there's a massive um, uh, movement to, um, to identify all, all of plant and animal life and put it onto a, a database and to also, which will also give it an automatic access to change. So kind of goes back, humans are looked at the same way by transhumans. So we have a sentient world simulation out of Purdue University, um, mm -hmm. which has been going on, I don't know, 10, 12 years now. It's well down the path of um, building an avatar for every human on the face of the earth. They, they probably yeah. have accomplished that. It's very difficult to get information from it, but um, it, then it's, it's similar to what's happening in the plant and animal world. So once you have someone, someone a chipped, identified, then you can easily go in and begin to manipulate their genetics, their their, their being, their, um, their human composition. So, so let's break this down a little bit, because this is fascinating. I remember this, uh, I believe you talked about this in your book too, where it's like, there's, um, it, it, through all the surveillance or all the data collection, all these different things that are going on, a, a database would store, let's say our, our image and our likeness, plus all of the characteristics it can 
um, derive from that. And then this is the, the part that I'd love clarity on. Are you then saying that some sort of chip or some sort of, uh, you know, the DARPA dust, for example, um, could be entered into that human passing back signals or I should say a connection monitor. to that database whereby so not only could it monitor you're saying it could then also update aspects of the physicality absolutely yeah. so right. th once again and and you know that, that, that you, we all have to keep in mind every time we talk or think about transhumanism is that it's an interlocking trinity and all yeah. three pieces of the Trinity are moving together to work together. So it's it's genetic engineering, it's geoengineering, like you say, Kim Trails, Harp, all of that, and it's social engineering, which is brain. So all of right. that, all three of those possibilities are woven into every every project. Mm -hmm. And and quite frankly. So you look at big projects like um, like Sentient World Simulation, and and they're also gathering all the biological information, like when you go to the bathroom, what your blood pressure is, and you know all that could be collected through TikTok. People all over the world are using TikTok, and there's there's massive amounts of international cooperation that are doing all of this together. Mm -hmm. Interesting. There's so much to sort of put, try and wrap your mind around in terms of like the scale at which I, you know, this goes back to when I was reading your book, I remember there are several, I think somewhere at the beginning you, you spoke about it, but then you kind of got into it at, at various points talking about the emotions, the, the, um, the experience uh, that you went through in researching all this stuff and kind of how dark it was to, uh, see the entire web of kind of what's unfolding here with this transhumanistic sort of agenda and how much it is, how real it is and how much it is moving forward. Um, and I, I was just, I was fascinated by, by a lot of those references because it can feel really overwhelming to imagine what's going on. And, and a lot of people might look at it, oh, well, you know, it's conspiracy nonsense, you know, don't, don't get into that. It's negative, but, but it is happening. Right. Like there, there's evidence of this stuff happening. And um, I guess how would you, you know, sort of be having been through the gauntlet, if you will, what would you leave people with? I mean, not not that we're you know, this is the, the end of things, but I'd love for, to, to give a, a take that you have on um, what you would help people keep in mind as they're navigating this information and going through this. In, I mean, this stuff's happening so fast. It's going to be in our face from here on out. Um, but what would you, how would you tell them to, to navigate this and not go into that despair? Well, my, my situation was a little different in that, as I said, I was working in Washington, D.C. Edgar was getting an increasingly um, unable, to, unable to work. And, um, and so living there, I just, I'm friendly, <laughs> talk to people. And so uh, people just kept handing me information, just left and right. And, and eventually I had the time and energy and I thought, wow, there's just been too much thrown at me here. I need to dig in. I mean, obvious things like we moved into an apartment complex in Maryland and I lived across the street from the Genome Project. I mean, what are the chances, right? So if I'm Genome Project, then I'm like, okay, what was the... The, the uh, Human Brain Initiative, what was that? Started back with George Bush, didn't start with Obama. Like, what was going on with all this? And I just kept all these pieces. And the more I, I would dig into it, the more I would find a connected piece to this. And, and, um, and I did. I, I got very traumatized by it. Very traumatized. And I take responsibility for, in many ways, traumatizing myself with this mm -hmm. because I just got so curious about all of it. And then after the curiosity came the feeling, curiosity's fun, but then came the feeling of, oh, what about the human species? What about my children? What about my, my grandchildren? What about my family? And that's when it sunk deep into me 
the reality of this and the and the and the darkness of it and the potential within it that was that was happening and um and as 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 life would you know life always throws you into situations for your betterment and my husband and I decided to move back to to Phoenix to live and we moved twice in Phoenix and every time you move it's just it's just you know packing unpacking all, all of that trying, finding a house to live in all all of that and and in that in those two moves i just really and i have children back here also i also have children in washington dc but you know you just you just begin to shift and i just began that probably a year long slow integration of all of this information I wanted to, I had wanted to write a book in Washington, but I knew I was too traumatized by it to write the book. So by the mm -hmm. time I got to Phoenix and got moved into where we live now, to our home, then I settled down. My nervous system calmed down and I thought, okay, I'm going to be okay to do this research and I could actually write the book. And then ironically, the publisher <laughs> was so... He was so intuitive. He's he's like, Rebecca, I'll publish your book, but nobody's going to read it for three years. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> People are really just now believing everything that I put in that book. I mean, even my family members, I had to quit talking about it because it was like, yeah. you know, mom, really? <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> there's going to well, be a vaccine passport. Really? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, there's so many, uh, there's so many references to, to, I think, t technologies and, and stuff that I would say that if, if you have been like a really in depth researcher into this cutting edge stuff, you know, as you have, that's how you would know about this. But the average person is kind of only ever seeing the, the VR stuff and the, you know, the sort of the, the pop culture y, advancements of, of technology, not realizing like DARPA had a vaccine, you know, years and years and years ago that they could upgrade the, the, the immune protection non-locally, right? So it's like, you know, this stuff has been around forever. So when, when quote unquote conspiracy theories arose asking the question, Hey, is there potentially something in these MRNA shots? Um, that wasn't like, unfathomably unrealistic to question it was like you should be asking that question you should be asking that. and, and that's yeah. that's part of so we also have to realize that 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 the traumatic response is also socially engineered so right. it's engineered for us to be to not be it's just like the whole ufo field and fortunately i've been in the ufo field all of my professional life. So I was used to this. I, I was used to mind control, social engineering. But the deliberate deprivation, I would say, it's deprivation, the deliberate deprivation on all levels, intellectually, emotionally, psychologically, of allowing humans public access to what's going on. Yeah. Engineers overwhelm. And when you engineer overwhelm, we go right back to what we were talking about before. People just become avoidant. I'm not going to think about yeah. that. I'm not going to live my life about that. It's got nothing to do with me. And, and I do go into my book a lot about um, Tavistock, Macy conferences. Um, those psychologists laid the groundwork for this social manipulation that we are living through. And we'll yeah. never take responsibility, ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a power to keeping. Uh, if you wanted to exert this power, there's a power to keeping you know humans in a state of survival, in a state of fear, and in a state exactly. of panic. And, and one of the themes that's coming up, you know, here in this conversation, when I think about your book, when I think about um, even this this subject of chemtrails, geoengineering, that kind of thing, and um, how there was so much you know, gaslighting about the questions. I mean, don't get me wrong. There was, there were stories within the, the story of geoengineering chemtrails that, you know, are debunkable and they're not, they're not great research, but then there's stuff that it's like, well, hold on a second. There is something happening and you can't just deny it. Right. And there, this, there's the story of, of how 
all of these discussions, all of the things like you wrote in your book that have now come to pass, that people are now paying attention to, it leads to this like, we, we tend as humans to like to pretend like something isn't really legitimate for a really long time and then, and then allow it to become legitimate and then like overnight, okay, this is legitimate now, but instead of listening to the folks that have been looking at this for years, we're still going to look at the mainstream perspective on this. And this is happening with UFOs right now. <laughs> and, you know, you have this, 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 you know, in the last four days, you have all these unidentified objects being shot down. Now, I know some of them, for example, was a, a, a balloon, a, a sort of quote unquote surveillance or weather balloon or data balloon, whatever you want to call it. It's all speculation at this point. But, you know, we're still, for the most part, looking to the mainstream to tell us what's going on. And I'm troubled by this. They control, um, I had a, I had a, a colleague of mine, he's since passed away, lovely man, and um, he, he had some, he had, he'd done some work with the World Economic Forum, and, and I just, I said to him, I said, Lawrence, how'd they pull this off? He said they owned every media corporation. Yeah. Once you own the media corporations, you own the narrative. You Wait. own the information funnel. I I uh, I bought a 1934 dictionary, and um, each each volume is like you know three or four inches thick, and there's mm. three volumes. Mm. If you would go to Barnes and Noble or a bookstore and buy a dictionary today. Where did the words go? <laughs> Talk about, yeah. you know, editing. That's that's a perfect example. That's making a crisper of the human vocabulary. Mm. We're just going to mm -hmm. slice some of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so and it's and what what I like is what Alana Freeland says, and I'm in total agreement with it. Is that each citizen, if they are to be a citizen, has to become a scientist. And they have yeah. to be become proficient in all of this. Yeah. And I think that, um, as I mentioned, um, I, I guess I can also say this. I had a conversation with Carol Rawls the other day. She's a good friend of mine. And we were talking about just what you mentioned that, um, you know, here we are with the, uh, with the narrative of these, quote, unidentified objects are, are suddenly UFOs. And um, I think um, I agree with you that a lot of the voices that should be heard are not being heard. Mm -hmm. And also that the narrative is coming out now because um, because of the of the proliferation of, of space weapons. Yeah, I think that's behind all of this that we will soon be in shock and awe, as they said in the Middle East, but beyond shock and awe mm. by the space weapons that we will witness now in our lifetime. And yeah. um, Carol was, um, Carol and C.B. Scott Jones and Edgar Mitchell. A a a that's the thing people don't realize about Edgar. Edgar was an avowed pacifist. Sure, mm -hmm. you know, when he was a young man, he was a Navy pilot and, and you know, hotshot test fighter pilot and all this sort of thing but deep in his heart and for years edgar edgar professed professed being being a pacifist yeah and i often think i look at these headlines you know i look at the my, my twitter feed in the morning and you know elon musk is ha 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 some of my visitors are gonna some of my friends are gonna pay a visit well, if anyone is hooked up to space weapons, it's Elon Musk. It's mm -hmm. th this this whole narrative is just to introduce the shock and awe of space weapons. Yeah, and we are at, I think, in many ways, um, we're we're at a um, Atlantean moment, an Atlantean moment with these space weapons. Yeah. And, weapons uh, are becoming too powerful for us to steward them. Yeah, and, you know another another colleague, Joseph Farrell. He writes about the cosmic wars and yeah. how the cosmic wars were a reality. And I think that we are space weapons are be, will become a cosmic war. 
Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's so much discussion around that. And, and the, I like, I, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think about like, let's, let's, let's go to the, let's go back to the pacifist slash peace uh, discussion for a second, because, you know, a lot of people are feeling um, we're in this time. Things are hurtling forward. I mean, look at look at what happened during COVID, and it requires humanity to, to step up and and do something, if you will. And that that idea can sometimes butt up with this idea of pacifism, and and with this idea of peace and maintaining a sense of peace. And we're seeing people want to pick up arms and and you know want to do all these things. And I'd be curious, like, what you think of those ideas of of I guess peace and pacifism as it as it relates to what we're being called to do to push back, if you will, or choose a different path uh, than what's being pushed forward in, in mainstream and pop culture. I think um, one of the one of the benefits of technology is that it has allowed. I, I would say a benefit for me, and I'm just I'm sure you probably feel the same way, is mm-hmm. that instead of finding a community here in Phoenix where I live, I'm able to find a community internationally yeah. of, of people who, who view life in much the same way that I do. So the, the myth of everybody on the planet's going to sway to the same frequency, maybe they did yesterday in the Super Bowl, but because they say that, the, that during the Super Bowl, all of that movement is a detachment of the astral body. I thought that was fascinating in that you could actually see the astral body swaying in the Super Bowl. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that was happening. But by and large, um, we have to let go of this belief, which the transhumanists have an overabundance of that they are going mm-hmm. to control everything. That every human, yeah. every plant, every animal, every piece of, of, of GMO dirt on the planet, they are going to control. Well, no, they're not. No, they're not. And it's, it's what I, the, the biggest lesson I think that I have, speaking sper- personally, coming out of this is that every day calls me to strengthen my spiritual and emotional and intellectual spine. Yeah. All, all, all parts of me, I have to strengthen in order to move through this day and navigate what's happening. And I need yeah. to be able to connect with people like Joe or Carol or whoever, Elaine, Elena, whoever I'm connecting with, that we can hold that, hold that frequency at this time together. Yeah, because it's it's just a myth that you know, and 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 I like how transhumanism built that myth with you know, wow, some of these people they have three hundred million followers, <laughs> and everybody yeah. got this idea that they were going to rule the world, and it's mm-hmm. just a false narrative. Period, mm-hmm. and so they lost sight of of the fact that. They need to think about creating another another pathway for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the idea of, you said it earlier too, with the idea of uh, people needing to become sort of a, a scientist to some extent, the everyday citizen. Um, you know, I think about this concept of being sort of a, an active player in this game where, you know, you're, we're, we're moving towards something. Like, it's one thing... Um, to, to want to enjoy life and to make the most of life and, and to have a family and to do these things. And, and I definitely wouldn't want to lose sight or balance of that. But, you know, at the same time, it's like we are in this space where so much of what we call life and the world we want to live in is being challenged and changed and pushed in a direction that I think if we really thought about it, we probably wouldn't like it. But we're not really thinking about it, right, as a culture, we're not really thinking really about where this is headed. And, you know, it kind of leads back to this question of like, 
how do we want our world really to look, right? Because you, you, you present it sort of in, in the book. It's like, it's like a choice. You can, you can ch- take the transhumanism past or you can take the, you know, maintaining what it means to be human as we know it now and, and then beyond. Um, you could take either path. Um, but but it, it begs this question. You have to ask, like, what world do you really want to live in? And I'm not sure that enough of us are, are, are really testing ourselves in, to ask that question and, and to push for what we're capable of. Yeah, that's well said. I, I feel also, and we've, we've had this discussion privately before, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of breakouts happening. Actually, I think this is fun. I think this kind of work that you and I are doing is, I get a lot of fun from it. I get yeah. really jazzed up to get, in the mo- get up in the morning and and start work and, and, and do what I'm doing. It's, it's really fun, it's invigorating, it's, it's, it's vital, it makes me feel vital. Just to myself, my energy system likes it. And, yeah. um, and, and I think that this is gonna be a time, and it's one of the reasons why um, I do my exoconscious work is because I believe that the internet's an old thing. Okay, I think we mm-hmm. both kind of agree it's, it's set. It's, I don't know which generation it's in right now, but it's an old thing by our, by our time standards. So I look at communities like your community, like my community, and I think we really need a new communication platform. Mm-hmm. And if we don't get it, and if we don't push ourselves to invent it, and it's not going to be blockchain, okay, what... What are, are, I mean, it could be, you know, the next generation becoming telepathic in terms of communication, but I think for health, for communication, for the essential bottom line ideas and inventions that people need to survive and thrive as natural human consciousness, then we need to come up with just some basic structures and so what, one of the ways, and Nancy Duterte, who's a really good friend of mine, she, she wrote the, the, the quote on the back of, of, of my book as a, as a commentary, and I use it often. And as, as, she, as we were talking the other day, um, we were talking about how if, if, if we're going, if, if we're on a highway and we see that this, this massive energetic truck is going to meet us head on, and we've got to change lanes, but we haven't built the lane yet. Mm. The lane's not built yet. Sure, we've got maybe some, you know, carvings of what we had in the past. Those aren't going to work. Mm-hmm. We have to build that new lane as individuals and as communities. And to me... That, that's kind of like, you know, somebody taps you on the shoulder and goes, hey, you know, you know, back in the medieval times, we're, we're all going to go build this cathedral. You want to do it with us? It's amazing while they want to build this cathedral. Yeah, I'd, I'd be signed up. I want to build that cathedral. Yeah. And it's the same thing for us right now. It's like allow your imagination, your enthusiasm to help you start to lay down those bricks on that road and build that structure. Because we all need each other at this point to do that. Because we don't have another lane yet. As nice yeah. as exoconsciousness sounds, it doesn't have a lane yet. And that's what I want to build. That's what I want to build. Yeah. I want to be a, a, a craftsperson in that, in that building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I totally feel you. I, I often, you know, sort of think about, this makes me think of like, you have... All right, we, we, we have our existing system and there's a lot of times people will say, well, we got to make some short term changes in our existing systems, right? Because, you know, that's what we have as we're building this new future. But we also have to kind of put our energy into building the new future. We can't just, you know, focus on the existing systems and, and you know, get get too caught up in that because then all of our energy is there. And so it becomes this sort of... Um, you know, where do we put our energy and, and, and in what ways do we create that new lane? And um, I think you kind of said it best when you, when you were saying to some extent, like we, we have to tap into our creativity or tap into our own passion, desire, intuition, if you will, to imagination, right? To, 
to know how to answer that question. Would you would you agree like that this if it becomes too much of a mental exercise, we will will probably go crazy versus if we can somehow tap into a deeper inspiration as to how to move forward. Well, I, I think also having that uh, th- the basic idea of the fact that our our consciousness is not our brain. So transhumanists mm-hmm. believe that the consciousness is the brain. That's why they spend all those billions of dollars and and ten years building their you know brain initiative. If if you if if, if we believe that consciousness is beyond the ba- brain, then so is critical thinking, and mm-hmm. so is creativity. And that's yeah. why moving into that galactic mind, we're it's it's like. Who the heck ever invented those cathedrals? I mean, Mm -hmm. the flying buttresses. And I mean, how cool was that back then? Yeah. They were tapping in beyond their brains. Mm -hmm. And and that's, and so it's not just, and and that sounds kind of Pollyanna a little bit until you get in a community of other people who trust the fact that in, this information is coming into them and needs to be put to use. Yeah. Yeah, and, and interestingly, I actually, I think we you referenced this earlier, the, uh, you know, the old beyond, beyond UFOs here. <laughs> and uh, what I think is interesting about this and, and why, I th- you know, even though it's a massive book, <laughs> what I find interesting about it is contactees or people who, um, whether it's multidimensional, whether it's, uh, actual, you know, they describe it as physical contact, whatever it might be, all seem to be getting similar messages, right? And uh, those messages, you know, usually have to do with what might be coming or what inspiration might need to be, you know, seeded to to create this new world. But th- there's a lot of, of similar messaging from thousands of, of, of people that have been studied that, that points to this need to get in touch in this way, to expand our, our humanness beyond uh, just the material and into the non-material. And um, I, I wanted to bring this up mainly because I find like one of the challenges when we're talking about all of this stuff is, is people just don't believe that contact experiences or multidimensional experiences are real or that there's been any rigor behind studying it. And I mean, this this book is, an, is is evidence of the amount of rigor that has gone into studying these people's experiences and 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 what's there. Um, and I, I just wish more people knew about this stuff so that they would be uh, the door would be open to want to explore this a little bit more deeply. Um, I'm curious what what you would say, uh, you know, as a person who I think you contributed to this book. Um, you know, you're a contactee yourself. Like how. The, the lay person who, who has not explored, you know, whether it's ET contact or consciousness or whatever, how would you open the door for them to become interested in, in this topic? Oh, just before I answer, I just want to say that I uploaded that chapter that I wrote in Beyond UFOs and all of my, mm-hmm. much of my writing to academia.edu. So that's all free. People could go on and read the papers and, and have free access just under my name. Uh, a, a couple of things that, that have happened working in this exoconscious coaching that I've been doing. And that's that. So I have a very, I, I have somewhat of a structure. So I'll, I'll, I put forth the structure and then everybody just talks. It's just about them talking and, and kind of finding their way together as this group mm-hmm. of people who've, who've, who've joined once a week. Inevitably, someone will show up and say, well, I, I got the questions this week and I have nothing to say. I, I, I haven't had any experiences like that and I, I have nothing to say. And by a half hour even, they're, they're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to share. Something just came to my mind. We, we don't have the context to be able to put it together, number one, which is like trying to build. And, and we're also putting um, the Exoconscious Coaching up on our television show, which is called Exoconscious Humans Television. And we're going to move three people through this 16 progressions. And I'm going to have an ebook that goes along with it. So if you can't join a group, 
on Zoom, then maybe you can do it do it by yourself and, and write your answers and, and collect your thoughts like that. Another issue is, so I have a master's in, in philosophical theology and I became acutely aware of the fact that in mainstream religions, and I did a lot of ecumenical work, that in mainstream religions across the board, ecumenically, you are not encouraged to talk about any of this. Hmm. Ever. And so religion, so uh, Edgar, Edgar liked to say, you know, 400 years ago, science and consciousness split. And religion was given consciousness and science was given all the other topics. And Edgar never said this, but I would add to that. So uh, what did religion do with it? <laughs> what did they do with all those years, those centuries that they were in control of consciousness? <laughs> Just mind control people with ritual? Mm -hmm. You know, was there any... Was there any collaboration with science or was it just this, this don't allow humans to know who they are is what it comes down to. And so saying that you can't relate or that you haven't had any experiences like this, I would say, of course you have, but you haven't learned the context in order to believe them or see them or to understand them, or to integrate them. Because for many people, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a childhood contactee. So for many people, they were shut down and silenced and made fun of. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, even as adult, we're living, living in Washington, DC, I, I would frequently just, people would cackle at me when I tell them what I did. They would cackle, like old fashioned, like, cackling <laughs> and I just was stunned <laughs> um, yeah so it's just a lot of this is just organically organically coming together and all, a lot of these barriers are just we're removing them from each other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that makes sense um, I wanted to ask a question earlier that I had forgotten to ask, and, and I, I want to bring it up again. A um, little bit, a little bit off track of what we were just talking about, but um, I, I can't remember if it was in your book or something else I was looking at of, uh, of yours when I was um, doing a bit of research before this. Um, you said something to the effect of the transhumanists are not necessarily trying to make robots like humans as much as they're trying to make humans like robots. Yeah. And I thought that was an interesting way to put it because when you think of it that way, it's like, it makes sense. A lot of where our culture is headed at the moment, when you see all these social media addictions and you see uh, the brain changes that are occurring as a result of all this stuff. But I'd love for you to expand on that idea if you can. Yeah, that was a funny awakening moment for me. <laughs> But I like to, um, so one of, one of the critical thinking skills I think is one of the best is learning to invert things. So I've been mm -hmm. taught this, but what if it's that? <laughs> so I just did a little inversion one day and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's what's happening. You know, humans are being engineered to become robots. And mm -hmm. um, once I began to see that reality, um, it put it in a very, very, very different context. And I began to um, see how it just wasn't, it just wasn't um, the social engineering, but how then when, so I wrote my book before COVID. I have a lot of things in there about COVID because I knew COVID was coming. I mean, you just, you mm -hmm. just know it's coming. And, um, and so, you know, that genetically they are, it's, it's about becoming roboticized. Yeah. And, and the other really important thing to realize, not only are, are we being engineered to become robots, but a critical thing to understand about transhumanism is that because it is computer-based, it is built on cybernetics. 
So cybernetics came out, and I go into this in detail in the book, but cybernetics came out, um, World War I, World War II, you know, these early generations of computers, you know, sort of data in, data out. And what they did was cybernetics is what's called a closed loop. In, uh, in psychology, it's called a double bind. And the, actually, the man that, that, that quoted the double bind theory, he's actually part of, he was actually part of either Tavistock, I think Macy Foundation. So they knew that humans could be psychologically trapped in a double bind. So it's kind of like a, a, a no-win situation, if you will. So mm-hmm. you're trapped in this system where the only possible answer is the system itself, if that makes sense. So that's what we're seeing mm-hmm. with the media. So the only possible data I'm going to receive is the data that the media is going to give me, and then I will then feed back into the system by data. So it's a very right. closed system. And, and right. so in my therapy, I kind of like thought, I kind of patched together these different professions, but I was so good, glad that I was a therapist because I would begin to see people coming to see me that had double binds and they didn't have mm-hmm. double binds at all. They just believed they did. And how strong right. that belief that, that in transhumanism, you can't get out of this double bind. You can't get out of this closed cyber system that you're in. Right. And yeah. and people will just want to live in it. Just like people want to live in a relationship that's a double bind and be miserable. And that goes into the nervous system and a lot of elemental um, work, uh, elementary work that was done by, um, if you're, if you're, participants are familiar with a man named John Bowlby. He he introduced a lot of information that's never been very public about how the human um, nervous system is designed from birth mm. and how the imprinting occurs and how it's, it's primarily mothers. So yeah. they had all this information of how to put people in double binds. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one of the fascinating parts I've been uh, been sort of studying as we've spoken about uh, in training in the trauma field for the last three years and yeah. um, nervous system health, all that kind of stuff, making slight a slight addition to the old career here. <laughs> but uh, but um, one of the most fascinating aspects of, of doing all this has been um, realizing that the more you understand physiologically about how the systems work, how your body works, and how your nervous system works, how that affects the brain, how that affects everything going on, you start realizing, oh my God, with this knowledge you could engineer, you could socially engineer people to do what you want so easily. Um, it would, they would have to be incredibly, like as humans would have to be incredibly um, self-aware, uh, uh, really independent in what they're willing to do and, and, and have a, a, an incredible amount of discipline in order to not be socially engineered in the ways that we have been. Um, meaning it, it's, it's just there's so much built into our physiology that without self-awareness and without a clear understanding of self, it's social engineering just becomes so simple, um, which is fascinating in the concept now of free will, right? That that as a planet with free will, there's this ability to hijack the human system that way if you had control of enough speakers, you know what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, it's, um, I, I also find, you know, to going back to the quote you said where uh, everyone should be a scientist, I feel like everybody needs to have knowledge of their nervous system and how it works and their how their physiology works because it's probably one of the most freeing things that I've come to understand in the last few years. I, that is so well said. And I, 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 I could admit publicly that had I had John Bowlby's information, <laughs> I would have been a better mother. <laughs> mm. if, if I had known um, how, what all that entailed. And, you know, of course, there's many things in life that you can't, you know, circumstances that you can't avoid. But um, and, and you 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 really just described an exoconscious human. It's it's not. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be um, a coast 
it's going to be an everyday, the, the amount, or not the amount, the degree to which humans are aware and, and conscious and monitoring themselves, as you just described, on a minute by minute daily basis, is going to change natural human consciousness. That's yeah, going to be a, a major change in consciousness because be, until now we didn't really have to do that. Yes, we we could coast, and there were there were structures in place and traditions in place. Now with them gone, you know, kind of in a, on a religious note, kind of reminds me of. Um, what happened with Martin Luther. So Martin Luther came, it's very similar to what's happening right now. So Martin Luther came out and said, you know, put up the 13 theses or whatever it was. And, but he said that the most important one is that priesthood of all believers, that every person was a priest, everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course that was to break down Catholicism, which it did to a, to an extent. But it's all, so underneath all that were the German princes coming in and stealing all the money out of the Catholic Church. I mean, it was a, a huge, a huge steal during, during the Reformation. Huge, huge money steal. And it's almost as if that was like a, a baby step. It's almost as if today with transhumanism, human consciousness has to take an enormous leap. Yeah. into who we haven't been mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, what's coming to me right now is just this idea of like one of the, the I don't know, I don't want to frame it as like a mistake, but I guess one of the misconceptions that I've witnessed a lot in the last you know, 15 years of being in sort of the consciousness, spiritual space, you know, that kind of thing, it's all kind of intertwined, has been this idea of like, what it means to be spiritual, and what it means to be conscious, or what it means to be awake. And uh, so much of it is, you know, um, costumes and lights, as opposed to what we're talking about here, which, which is to say, like, you know, spiritual doesn't have to mean that, you know, you, you're constantly having these divine experiences and connections and blah, 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 as much as it's like, how much are you really here now awake, aware of your, of yourself, of your body, of your, of your, your, your own inner guidance of your own connection to nature, your relationships with people, your, do you know what I'm saying? That like deeper present awareness, as opposed to sometimes what also could become like, again, going back to avoidant practices, right? Like I want to meditate because I want to escape how I feel right now in this human body. Right. And, um, I think that's an interesting reframe that's also occurring is this, this re-exploration of, of sort of what it means to even be spiritual. Yeah. I think that, um, I've done a lot of study in mystery schools and I think the mystery schools knew that we were coming to this time, certainly, you know, Rudolf Steiner and his, work with Armand and Lucifer, he he had pretty much laid out, this is what humans are going to be, are going to be dealing mm -hmm. with. And they saw how, mass, how massive it was back, you know, a hundred years ago. And, um, and, and they did bring out some important spiritual principles like reincarnation, meditation from the East, you know, that sort of, you know, the, the whole telepathic abilities of humans, um, mediumship, all of that, and I think that had they not done that, honestly, Joe, I think it would have been a complete takeover by by the transhumans, a complete takeover, because the church was just not able to do that, but the mystery mm -hmm. schools were able to do that, yeah. and I think now that information has been brought forth, um, into the mainstream consciousness, as you say, and now it's up to us to decide how 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 we're going to integrate it, how we're going to how we're going to deal with it, how we're mm -hmm. going to um, co-create, and and I think humans are going to have in this future that we're talking about this this new path that we're opening. Humans are going to have almost, a, not almost, a superhuman concept 
of our life between death and and our next reincarnation. And we're going to have a very different concept of what death even is, what our soul is, what our spirit is. That's what I see as spirituality is, yeah. is bringing forth those new understandings in, in partnership with science. And I think one of the yeah. leaders of that uh, is really is Brazil. People in Brazil, people in Brazil practice spiritual science, you know, Alan Kardec and other leaders mm -hmm. in spiritual science. And, and they've, they've oriented their, 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 their mental thought like that. And they join these study groups and they learn about it. They learn about spiritual science and it has yeah. such, such a deep resonance. It's not, it's not all just, you know, sure. Do I think sound healing is amazing? Yes, absolutely. Do I think that sound acoustics for agriculture is amazing? Absolutely. But I also feel that spiritual science is going to bring in these other um, abilities and other knowledge that we don't even have a clue about at this point. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's uh, it's funny in my brain, there's this resistance that's always like, yeah, but there's always going to be so many of us who are just never going to want to acknowledge the non-material. And, and that may be, like, I think you mentioned before, you know, there's not going to be this one as, you know, David Wilcock always talks about this, like solar flash. It's just like, I never see this as like a possibility, right? Like it, it's so, it just doesn't resonate at all that, that, you know, it, it feels like there's a transition. There's groups of people, there's different people that like every other time in history, every other revolution in history has followed this same path of, you know, uh, some people start playing with these ideas, exploring these ideas, expanding upon these ideas, and eventually uh, it hits a critical mass. And then that's like kind of a new way moving it's forward a for a point. while, right? And, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, I think for people, it's like getting, exploring how much of this is actually grounded in, in, in a scientific type of rigor, I think is a very useful thing to do, given how material our society and our culture has been for so long I, I you know it's a it's an easy transition to really look at consciousness sciences and and explore that but um alan kardec and that that whole story i i actually just recently bought um what is it called the spirit spirit book um is the i think is the piece that he he ended up putting out and i just recall like that whole story is fascinating but the end of i actually watched a movie about it and the end of it after these like they literally prove like here's a guy that's gone from pure materialism to now he's open to non-material sciences and and then the church just burning his books at the end right like as like erasing everything you know they had kind of done that's it that it was a fascinating and chilling moment uh because it came along with so much of what censorship uh, is doing today and and um and censorship has always been part of humanity. Humanity has always mm -hmm. censored it, itself. I mean, the the burning yeah. of the library in Alexandria, you know, this the the floods or fires or or whatever that information is it, it it's it's got a it doesn't necessarily have a lifespan. Just because you wrote a book, your your book may disappear. And it, mm -hmm. it sort of brings you down to ground zero, as you were saying about this is my life is not about being a writer or having a TV show. My life is really about my day to day soul and my spirit and my mind and using them and my emotions and using them in a, in a healthy way. It's not mm -hmm. about an ego trip or you know scaring everybody with a with a solar pulse or whatever. You know, is the sun changing? Yeah, absolutely. Is that affecting us? Yes, absolutely. I actually just I just ordered Robert Schrock's book on uh, on that on the solar influences throughout yeah. the millennia. That's to, just to get a better grip of it. But um, that's about and and once once you turn inward and are caring so we call it um spiritual sovereign spiritual autonomous individuals exoconscious people are so sovereign autonomous um spiritual moral people 
And um, once you make that commitment, as you so well said, about being aware every day of who I am, the choices I'm making, the actions that I'm partaking in or choosing, then, and I am caring for myself, micro, that just naturally moves out to the, to the macro community and those around mm-hmm. me in an yeah. effortless way. Absolutely. And that's, that's well said. And, um, you know, our time is, is pretty well up here, oh. but you know, great, great way to end it. Oh. I, I really Thanks enjoyed for having that, me, uh, Joe. Yeah. that last piece. Yeah, no, thank you for coming on. I, I encourage everybody check out. I'm, I'm like, should I read it or should I show it to the camera? <laughs> <laughs> um, Excellent where, where's the best place for people to get your book if they want? Oh, it's to on it Amazon. Easy. Yeah. All my books are on Amazon. And we also have a uh, uh, Extra Conscious Humans YouTube that we're mm-hmm. in, um, interviewing some fascinating people. And next month, we're going to be starting the Extra Conscious Humans progression. Uh, the people who've been in the coaching groups talking about their contact, talking about integrating. Nice. It's going to be exciting. Once again, moving from that inner, inner experience and this kind of nice little egg of group coaching moving that outer into the yeah. into the world to share but thanks for having me absolutely